The second speaker is Dr. Derek Tate, and after the presentation, we'll have a panel discussion. Now let me introduce Dr. Tate. Hello, I'm Derek Tate, um, and I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me to talk at this conference. And I've been asked to talk on TV state of the art and the implications for Africa. So as I'm sure everyone here is very well aware, tuberculosis is the number one infectious disease killer globally. And it has killed more people in the last 200 years than any other infectious disease, as you can see in the graphic on the um, left. The world's population is estimated at about 7.4 billion, and one third of the population are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, of whom 10% will go on to develop active TB. So you can see there's an enormous burden of infected people in the world, 10% of whom are going to go on to develop active TB. In 2019, there were 10 million new cases of tuberculosis, and 3 million of these were undiagnosed and untreated, which shows the big gap we have in ensuring that everyone gets diagnosed and treated. There were 1.4 million deaths due to, due to tuberculosis, and it is the leading killer of people living with HIV. Approximately a quarter of all antimicrobial resistant related deaths are due to tuberculosis, and there were approximately half a million new cases of drug resistant TB in 2019. In Africa, we find that 15 of the 30 high burden TB countries are based in Africa, and the highest incidence of TB disease is also in Africa. Overall, Africa has an incidence of TB disease of 226 per 100,000 of the population. And in South Africa, which is one of the highest incidence countries in the world, we find that it's about 615 out of 100,000 population. To end the TB epidemic, we absolutely need new tools. These are drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines. So the WHO NTB strategy targets a 95% reduction in TB mortality and a 90% reduction in TB incidence by the year 2035. And you can see in the graphic on the right here that at the moment, the current global trend is around about a decrease of a 1.5% per annum is going to come nowhere close to meeting the 2035 target. If we utilize the tools we have at the moment in far better, more efficient manner, we can actually start um, pushing this curve down. But even doing that, we're not going to achieve the 2035 targets. To achieve those targets, we need new tools such as vaccines, which are probably going to be essential in achieving the 2035 target, new diagnostics, which allow us to diagnose the disease for easier and earlier, getting people onto treatment, and we need new treatments as well. So in 2018, the United Nations held a tuberculosis high-level meeting, and a declaration was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations on the 10th of October of that year. And in this declaration, most countries in the world reaffirmed their commitment to end the tuberculosis epidemic globally. And it included ambitious and bold targets for a variety of things, including the scale-up of tuberculosis care and prevention services, research for new tools, principles of equity and human rights, and also resource needs targets for both implementation and research. Unfortunately, we're falling behind on all of the key targets, and especially the target for funding. Um, I think this is something that advocates need to um, take into account when they are speaking to various decision makers um, and stakeholders, and also the WHO is looking to hold countries who made commitments, hold them accountable for those commitments. One of the big problems we have is COVID-19. Um, it has had a massive impact on tuberculosis. As everyone knows, there are poor COVID-19 outcomes in patients with tuberculosis, but also there's been a severe impact on the TB control programs. Um, participants or patients have been unable to attend clinics. Um, clinics, have, to some extent, had some of the infrastructure repurposed for COVID. People have been scared to go to clinics. Um, 
And not only does that have a problem in terms of diagnosis, but there have been treatment interruptions, etc., which have all had a massive impact on tuberculosis control. And obviously this has, goes with increased morbidity, mortality, and importantly also transmission, because people are taking longer to get diagnosed, and people on therapy are stopping the therapy earlier. It also had a massive impact on TB research programs, many of which were actually stopped for a few months um, due to SARS-CoV-2. And another big concern is the impact on future research funding. Enormous amounts of money have been diverted or have been pushed in the direction of um, SARS-CoV-2 research, and there's concern as to whether this will impact on future TB funding. But all of the, the total impact, yeah, modeling work done by the um, Stop TB uh, organization has modeling would suggest that we have lost five to eight years of what has been slow progress, but nevertheless progress. But a five to eight year loss is a significant setback. However, there are lessons from COVID-19 for TB going forward. There was massive COVID-19 innovation on health technologies, social change, behavioral change, policy change, and all. And I think these are the sorts of things which in TB we really need to learn from and implement in terms of trying to um, move TB control forward. Also utilize new developments that were advanced by um, COVID-19 um, such as digital support systems for labs, and also very importantly, also for contact tracing. I think also one other big lesson from COVID going forward as well is that there's a political understanding now that health is wealth. Coronavirus had a massive, sudden impact on the economy of the world. TB continues to have an impact on the economy of the world, but I think because it's been a long, insidious process, people haven't noticed it as much as they've noticed it with COVID-19. So again, hopefully that political understanding will drive things forward. So moving on then to some of the developments that we've had in um, drugs on this slide and later on on diagnostics and um, vaccines. There's now a four-month course therapy for drug sensitive TB, which is a monumental achievement. Since the 1980s, in other words, for 40 years, we've been using a six-month treatment course. And clearly, if you have a shorter course, it'll improve adherence, it will reduce costs for the health system, and also for people with TB. And in the study, just over 2,500 participants were randomized to one of three regimens, either standard of care for six months, or a reg four-month regimen where rifapentine was substituted for rifampicin, or a four-month regimen where rifapentine was um, substituted for rifampicin and moxifloxacin substituted for thambutol as the basement for as the basis of for a four-month treatment. Safety was similar in all arms, and the rifapentine moxifloxacin arm met the criteria for non-inferiority. Rifapentine substitute for rifampicin was inferior to standard of care. And obviously the WHO will be considering these results in future treatment guidelines, but certainly shortening the um, treatment course from six months to four months is, as was said at the um, 51st union meeting, a monumental achievement. Drug-resistant tuberculosis remains an enormous problem. Approximately 500,000 people develop drug-resistant tuberculosis in 2019. It's estimated that 37% of people are diagnosed with drug-resistant tuberculosis. 31% of people are actually started on treatment, and only 12 to 17% of people are actually successfully treated. So there is a massive gap between the cases and the number diagnosed, which obviously indicates that we need better diagnostics that are more readily available. And also there's a continued need for cheaper, more effective and shortened treatment regimens so that if we do increase the number of people that are actually diagnosed and put onto treatment, appropriate treatment for drug-resistant tuberculosis, a far greater percentage will actually end up being successfully treated. I think it's another thing that's important to note is there's no evidence suggesting that molecular mechanisms of drug resistant in mycobacterium tuberculosis affect the susceptibility to immune control. So it is highly likely that a vaccine that is protective against drug 
sensitive TB will be equally as protective against drug resistant TB and that will make an enormous difference to the um, spread of or to the development of and to the spread of drug resistant tuberculosis. TB preventive treatment is also very important. It, obviously it will reduce the burden of ill health and death caused by TB and it's an important arm of TB control programs. Um, Shorter and better tolerated courses are now available. We don't have to rely on the old six month or nine month isoniose regimens. And the WHO, in fact, has um, identified groups of people that should be receiving TB preventive treatment. And those are children under the age of five, people living with HIV, and household contacts. And you can see the United Nations high level meeting target here is not remotely being met. It's um, with 20% of children receiving um, TB preventive therapy. Approximately half of 6 million people living with um, HIV are receiving preventive therapy, which is still far less than it should be. And only 2% of household contacts receive TB preventive therapy. So again, these are um, these are um, tools we have at hand at the moment and really the big thing that is missing here is implementation and as I've already said there are shorter courses available and there are courses available where people take treatment once a week for example. In 2019 an estimated 10 million people developed active TB. Nearly 30% were either not diagnosed or they were not reported as being diagnosed. So clearly there's a massive gap in terms of diagnosis of TB and we really need to improve the implementation of the available tools that we have at the moment but apart from them we need new and better tools and they are essential to develop to deliver low-cost rapid accurate TB screening and diagnosis and extremely important closer to the point of care Find in the WHO developed target product profiles which reflect those characteristics. And there's a rather rich pipeline. Many of these TB diagnostics will be coming onto the market within the next year or so. And these are a variety of diagnostics. So rapid molecular tests for decentralized TB detection and drug sensitivity testing, which is extremely important. And then non-sputum based point of care tests for detecting TB, for example, in urine or stool. We also need tests for TB infection, um, the tests we have at the moment, IGRA test and TST um, take time to either take time to read or alternatively need to be sent off to central laboratories. And these are important for us to determine whether people are infected or not, if they're in high risk groups and who might, who might benefit from um, TB preventive therapy. And then Clearly also it would be important to develop assays for treatment, monitoring or test of cure. So moving on to vaccines, there were groundbreaking advances in TB vaccine development in 2018. M72A01E is the first vaccine since BCG, which was developed 100 years ago to demonstrate TB disease prevention. In this study of just over 3,500 participants, 26 participants developed TB in the placebo arm, 13% in the M72 arm, which gave us a vaccine efficacy of 50%. And as I've already said, this is truly groundbreaking. The study is now moving into phase three. And if the, these results are confirmed in phase three, this, if it's widely implemented and made available, um, this should have a, an immediate impact on the TB epidemic. Um, in 2018 as well, there was a prevention of TB infection study done in adolescents, looking at with three arm studies, placebo, H4, IC31, and BCG. And the, these were adolescents who were recruited into the study who had no evidence of infection with TB, and then they were vaccinated and followed up to see if they seroconverted their quantiferin or IGRA assay, and if they if that happened, they were considered then to have been infected. Um, and the primary endpoint of quantiferin conversion was not met for either of the H4 or BCG, but a secondary endpoint of sustained quantiferin conversion, in other words, where someone had a positive, where someone converted and maintained 
their positive conversion through um, six months. Um, this was not met for um, H4, but for BCG versus placebo, there was a 45.4% efficacy. And this study has been, and this outcome has been confirmed for BCG in a larger study. In conclusion, Africa contains a disproportionate TB burden. There's been significant loss of progress towards the TB elimination due to COVID-19. And we do have existing tools at the moment, and we do need better use of those existing tools. New tools to meet the TB eradication goals are essential, as we've talked about. And there has been significant progress with new drug regimens, a rich pipeline of new TB diagnostics, and promising TB vaccine candidates, which are progressing to phase three clinical trials. And I think also very importantly, we need to honor the commitments made to the end tuberculosis epidemic globally by 2030, as per the United Nations Policy Declaration on Tuberculosis. Thank you very much.